Hi, I'm Dr. Durusha, the Vice President of Aspire and the Chair of the Education Committee. And I'm thrilled to announce a new initiative from Aspire called Aspire Ed Talks. Get ready to dive into a world of insights, discoveries, and expert opinions. Whether you're a student, a lifelong learner, or someone passionate about health and education, Aspire's Ed Talk is designed for you. Uh, good morning to all those in the west of Asia Pacific region, and good afternoon to those in the east. I welcome you all to ED Talks, which is a new initiative by the Education Committee of Aspire. Today, we have first of, uh, a first of it in the series, and this is on thyroid and infertility. All of us are aware that hyper and hypothyroidism can affect both male as well as female fertility, and awareness of the thyroid status in the infertile couple is crucial because of its significant, frequent, and reversible or preventable effects on infertility. I welcome uh, you to this insi insightful live dialogue with an esteemed expert in the field, Dr. Shashank Joshi, on various aspects of thyroid dysfunction and infertility. Uh, he is a consultant endocrinologist uh, in India, and he's affiliated with several hospitals uh, in Mumbai. He has more than 1,000 publications to his credit, and he has been awarded with Padma Shri, uh, an award from Government of India for distinguished services in the field of medicine. Uh, our distinguished expert today will illuminate the complexities as well as share invaluable insight uh, and address your inquiries, empowering us with knowledge to navigate this crucial nexus with greater understanding and efficacy. Uh, I uh, will go on with the first question. So, Dr. Joshi, uh, does thyroid uh, play an important uh, role in the reproductive function, both uh, in the male as well as the female? Absolutely. I think, uh, first of all, at the onset, I must thank uh, Dr. Madhuri Patil, uh, who is a uh, dynamic global reproductive endocrinologist and gynecologist and input lead expert and a close friend of mine. Uh, so you asked a very pertinent question that thyroid has a direct impact on male and female infertility. And, uh, you know, screening for thyroid disorders and knowing that thyroid is one of the reversible causes uh, which could contribute to infertility. So in management of an infertile couple, uh, this is a very key area because there is an element of reversibility here uh, because treating on time uh, and screening on time may be a, a, a life changer for the couple. So I think uh, being aware of thyroid is very important. Uh, I lead the Indian Thyroid Society and the Asia Oceana uh, Society and uh, I thank Aspire uh, for starting this uh, educational program which is committed uh, to various aspects of infertility to start with thyroid health. So I think recognizing that there is a thyroid issue uh, in an infertile couple is important. Screening it, diagnosing it, and treating it. Because remember that there is an element of reversibility here. And therefore, uh, it's very important to recognize the uh, issues related to thyroid. So somebody has a pre-existing thyroid disease, uh, obviously, we need to optimize the goals of treatment and it is a very simple goal of optimizing and keeping a TSH in range and ensuring that the autoimmune status of the individual is appropriate. But if somebody doesn't know that they have thyroid, it's important that in the screening port protocol of an infertile couple to add a thyroid function test and add an antibody screening profile in the armamentarium of tests which are done. Uh, so it's important that we look at the autoimmune thyroid uh, disease uh, in all these infertile couples. So it is not that we do it only in those uh, uh, those uh, couples uh, wherein they have hypothyroidism, but I think it should be a part uh, part of investigations in all couples. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Absolutely. So I think uh, there are two things. Uh, Madhuriji, you rightfully mentioned 
that there is a hypothyroid state and a hyperthyroid state. And then there is a euthyroid state. So whether you are hyper, hypo or euthyroid, first is clinically check if there is a presence or absence of a goiter. In a goiter, which is a swelling of the thyroid gland, see whether it is diffuse or multinodular or unilodular. So is there a simple nodule? Is there a multinodular goiter or is there a diffuse goiter? If there is a goiter, the pathway is also to do a sonography of the thyroid gland with a fine needle aspiration cytology to know what is the biopsy of that. Then you look at the thyroid function status. Is it euthyroid? Is it hyperthyroid or hypothyroid? Because during infertility treatments, many people are on different types of hormones or peptides or, or, or contraceptives like hormones, like estrogens, progesterones, micronides, etc. It's important to do free T3, free T4 and TSH. I insist on doing all the three. Uh, if there is an access issue, affordability issue, then you can do T3, T4 and TSH. And if the uh, person, lady is pregnant, then you have to have a factorial of multiplication of 1.5 to see the normal range. So that is as simple as that. Then second thing which you rightfully mentioned is screening for autoimmunity. If it is hypothyroid state, then the simple antibody we do is anti-TPO antibody. And if it is hyperthyroid state, the antibody is different. So if there is thyroid eye disease, like uh, eyes popping out called orbitopathy or exophthalmos, and there is hyperthyroid state, means T3, T4 is elevated, TSH is low, then we do a simple antibody called TSH receptor anti. So remember, whenever you are screening for thyroid disease, check for a presence or absence of goiter, number one. Number two, do free T3, free T4, TSH. If free T3, free T4, TSH is high and TSH is low, it is hyperthyroidism. If free T3, free T4 is low, TSH is high, it is hypothyroidism. And finally, if for autoimmune thyroid disease, do two antibodies. If it is hypo, do anti-TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibody, formerly called as AMA also. And if it is hyper, do TSH receptor antibody. Beyond that, beyond these two tests also, very rarely we do other tests. So if you are able to do these tests, we get an indirect idea about the presence or absence of thyroid disease. Many a times it may happen that the pre-T3, pre-T4 or T3, T4 may be normal bug regime, but only the TSH is out of range. And that state, and there may be no symptoms, that stage is called subclinical hypothyroid or subclinical hyperthyroid stage. So what is the normal reference is the key issue of TSH. So if there's one test, if you have to screen in, uh, you know, for infertility, it is only TSH. If there are two tests, okay, it's only TSH and anti tpo antibody. And then you can add and subtract other tests. So that's as simple as that. And try to keep your TSH between 1 and 2.5, wherever, whichever part of the world you are in. If your TSH range is between 1 and 2.5, you are good. It is normal. Anything about 2.5 and 4 is debatable. But it is definitely borderline. And if you are having recurrent fetal miscarriages, recurrent uh, you know, history of uh, uh, bad obstetric history, or if there is history of uh, uh, prolonged infertility, then you may need to then intervene or look at a therapeutic trial. Particularly if the antibody is strongly positive, there is presence or absence of goiter, etc. Occasionally, we also, Madhuriji, add a lipid profile. Because when the person is borderline hypothyroid, then there is a dyslipidemia, which means that the cholesterol may be elevated. And that's an indirect clue to know that there is an underlying subclinical hypothyroid disease. So occasionally, we do add a lipid profile in the gamut of tests of thyroid disorders. I hope this clears up an approach to, uh, you know, screening for thyroid disease. In hypothyroidism, it's also seen that the prolactin levels are elevated. And therefore, many a times uh, where you have hyperprolactinemia, just treating thyroid disorders may uh, even normalize the prolactin levels. Uh, so so uh, there's a reason for that, that the TSH uh, is controlled by a pituitary hormone, uh, thyrotropes, which make it. And next to thyrotropes sit the lactotropes which secrete prolactin. So they are neighbors in the pituitary. And what happens when the TSH goes above 8, then there is a spillover effect. 
on the lactotrope and the prolactin goes up. But if your TSH is below 8 or 10 and if your prolactin is high, then that prolactin is unlikely due to the underlying hypothyroidism. So there is a clue here that if the prolactin and TSH both are out of range, then there has to be a concordance, no discordance. So if the TSH is below 8 or 10 and prolactin is elevated and usually we do a pooled prolactin, then <clears throat> you treat thyroxine without any cabergodin, the prolactin will automatically come down. But for that, the TSH value has to be above 8 or 10 because the thyrotropes and lactotropes, as I said, are neighbors in the pituitary gland, which secrete the prolactin and thyroid stimulating hormone. Remember, TSH is a pituitary hormone and T3, T4 are secreted by the thyroid. So it's very important to recognize space and I'm very happy, Dr. Madhuri, that you got out this fact of prolactin because often what happens is that we, we get cases in infertility where there's an isolated elevated prolactin and the antibody is strongly positive yeah. and the TSH is normal. Then sometimes you may have to address prolactin as an issue and always rule out the physiological causes of elevated prolactin. So if you are looking at prolactin, it could be nipple stimulation, it could be you know, intercourse on the previous day, anything which can increase the prolactin. So it's important to recognize that you eliminate those causes, but you're absolutely right that treating thyroxine sometimes because of the spillover phenomenon can actually normalize prolactin. Yeah, so sometimes we have patients wherein the TSH is normal, uh, but only the anti-TPO antibodies are elevated. So then do we treat the, uh, this group of patients or uh, we should not treat them? Because again, uh, that's quite debatable. And uh, many a times, most infertility clinics do not really assess the antithyroid antibodies. But I think you have totally made it clear that it is very, very essential. Uh, so uh, what do we do in these cases? So Dr. Madhuri Patil, we are in evidence-based uh, medicine. And in evidence-based medicine, they have done randomized control trials where the TSH is normal and antibody is positive. And they have given thyroxine to one group and control to another group. So if you look at the pooled summary of all the meta-analysis, and if there is autoimmune thyroid disorder with a normal TSH and a trial of thyroxine is given, there is an odds ratio of 1.3, 1.4 that there may be benefits in particularly women who are infertile. There is refractory infertility or there are recurrent or fetal miscarriages, particularly in the first trimester. So it is important to recognize that giving a therapeutic trial in this set of case may be worthwhile. However, it has to be individualized by the domain expert. Okay, so if you ask me, if I somebody see a patient who is say coming from an infertile expert like you for a positive antibody status, then I do a little more deep diving. I ask for family history of thyroid disease. I see for presence or absence of goiter. I see a lipid profile. I see the obstetric stroke uh, abortion history. And if all these are strongly positive, then my likely yield of treating with thyroxine for three months with a trial of thyroxine, with say 25 micrograms of thyroxine, may be beneficial. Because see, we are outcome centric. And fundamentally, we are looking at an optimal outcome in infertility. And therefore, in the yield of the outcome, the current global research data on RCT evidence suggests a, 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 a direction of positivity towards a treatment or therapeutic trial. And this has been recognized even in unexplained infertility. If you read books 30 years back and see the evidence base which has been generated in the last 30 years, there is a suggestion to, if in doubt, give a therapeutic trial. So in the presence of thyroid dysfunction and if it's not detected, uh, how is the treatment uh, outcome affected in the infertile couple? See, thyroid dysfunction, as you rightly said, can affect the male and female both. And it can hamper ovulation, it can hamper endometrial implanting, it can hamper, you know, uh, it can cause an ovulatory dysfunction in the female, as well as in the male can hamper spermatogenesis also and impact sperm motility also. So thyroid disorder has a direct impact on the outcome of male and females both. 
in the infertility scenario. And therefore, it's important to screen, recognize, and treat because it may be very subtle, as you rightly said, or what we call as masked. And many a times you see when you are able to get the couple and the lady pregnant, you will suddenly see a TSH shooting up. So throughout your infertility treatment, the person's thyroid status may be screened, may be negative or normal, and you suddenly see a TSH of 8 or 10 in the first trimester or at the diagnosis of pregnancy. And that is not unusual. Only thing is don't panic and start treatment. <clears throat> you see, thyroxine is a very safe compound. And giving a treatment trial with it doesn't hurt at all. So low dose of thyroxine. What is the worst case scenario side effect it will do? At the worst, it will cause a little bit of aerosol. And occasionally it can cause chest pain or palpitations or tachycardia. So if you are really having someone who can't handle thy thyroxine, and gets palpitations or, or tachycardia, you can do a simple ECG. But, but for that, sometimes giving a treatment trial is actually going to yield an outcome rather than not treating it at all. So I, I hope that I have given some clarity and direction in the way one would approach and give a treatment trial in masked or subtle way to unmask underlying thyroid disease. Uh, so we also know that when uh, we treat uh, our infertile couples, especially when we are giving gonadotrophins, uh, not with the oral ovulations, but we find that because of the elevated uh, estrogen levels, uh, it can affect the thyroid function and it is seen that the TSH many a times increases. And this increase uh, will last for a longer time, especially uh, in the presence of antithyroid antibodies. Uh, so do we take any special precautions when... We are going to treat these patients with gonadotrophins or, and especially when they are going for ERT because in ERT we give a higher dose or we if they are uh, hypothyroid and the patient is on medication, whether do we increase the dose slightly in this group of patients? So we need to treat them to target. This is a very good question. And you are absolutely right that gonadotrophins or a little bit of estrogen backbone is going to be marginally elevating the TSH. And we are treating them to a target. So my target TSH for fertility pregnancy is usually 2.5 or 3. Now, of course, this TSH targets have to be for TSH reference ranges for that particular geography or country. And we are here talking about entire Asia. And therefore, when we are talking of that, it is reasonable to keep the TSH below 3. And then, therefore, you may have to uptitrate the dose by 12.5 or 25 micrograms of thyroxine. So Dr. Madhuri, it's very, very important to up titrate the dose in such situations. But the titration, now we have thyroxine available in a factorial of 12.5. So we have 12.5, 25, 37.5, 50, 62.5, 75, 88, 100. So a marginal increase in the dose and keeping the TSH below 2.5 and 3 doesn't hurt because at best, it will give you a better outcome without causing harm. So it's very important to recognize that we keep optimal range of thyroxine with the optimal dose of thyroxine. And that is so crucial and important. Also remember, our TSH reference ranges are a little higher, for example, in the Indian geography compared to the Western world, where a lot of published evidence exists. That is because there is we are now... There are two types of geographies which influence the TSH values. Are you iodine deficient? Are you iodine sufficient? So when there is more and more iodine in the geography of consumption of food, the TSH reference range tends to be higher and the antibody status comes to be higher. See, we are seeing an explosion worldwide in Asia of thyroid diagnosis. It is because of two reasons. One is because the iodine is now getting not deplete, but replete, which means the whole iodine is becoming sufficient in all the geographies. And this iodine intake is directly or indirectly impacting the higher levels of TSH in the normal reference range and is triggering autoimmunity. So by mistake, the antibodies are being directed against the iodine and that is what is exploding the entire thyroid, uh, you know, uh, what you call as like a pandemic-like values which we are getting. 
And second is, of course, the ease of screening and testing. Testing has become affordable, available, and very economical. Yeah, the other thing is, uh, just coming to male uh, infertility, uh, I just wanted to know that whether we should test all uh, male partners or only those having abnormalities in their sperm parameters for uh, thyroid function. See, because thyroid disorders are on the rise, if finance is an issue, I would probably be filtering them on if there is an abnormal sperm or a erectile dysfunction and smoker males. Remember, smoking impacts the male fertility. So if there's a smoker or, you know, but if you ask me in my infertility protocol, a TSS screen for a man and woman is almost mandatory with an antibody because it is always better to treat than not to treat. And this is something reversible. So I think I would, if you ask me, you know, I would, I would screen for everybody. If there is a rate limiting step of cost, then only I will then filter these two yardsticks. Again, goiter presence, dyslipidemia, smoker gets added here, and uh, abnormal uh, sperm parameters. parameters. Uh, so at the end of it, I would like to ask that uh, uh, it's very important that we uh, control the hypothyroidism, uh, especially for an optimal neonatal outcome. So in case... Uh, there are, I mean, for some reason, it's not being tested or it's not been treated. Uh, so what would be the neonatal outcome be, uh, especially when there is uncontrolled uh, hypothyroidism? So you can, uh, you know, the there are two, three types of outcome which can come. Adequate thyroxine throughout pregnancy is the key. And therefore, increasing the dose and maintaining it in range is very important. So in the first trimester, second trimester and third trimester. Keep your TSH at 2.5, 2.5 and 3 respectively. If you are able to keep it at that, then you will have optimal maternal and neonatal outcome both. Unfortunately, as you said, if you are not able to treat it to target or the person is diagnosed late, then whenever you get the first encounter, when you make the diagnosis, aggressively treat it and ensure that you get an optimal outcome. Even after that, if you are able to get an outcome which is not optimal, the only impact you can have remotely is that you can occasionally get a lower IQ or a, a adverse neonatal outcome. But that is now being seen very rarely because of the large amount of facilities to screen for TSS and treat it aggressively. Remember, most of the neonatal outcomes which we see in the books are described when we were seeing a TSS of 80 or 100. And we do see that in rural remote access places where somebody for the first time in the third trimester we are seeing with such high TSS. <clears throat> then also if you treat, then the likelihood of an adverse neonatal outcome in severe uncontrolled hypothyroidism is likely to be adverse. But in most of the other cases which we see in the infertility world, the likelihood of outcome, which are for neonatal outcome, is pretty robust, pretty good, and pretty strong. So I don't think there is a fear factor here. I think it's a factor of awareness and then screening and treating to a target or a reference range, which is the key. But most important last point I want to make is autoantibody and antibody generation is also linked to biological and physical and mental stress. And therefore, ensuring that the couple is happy, they are cheerful and positive, because the infertility process itself is very stressful. I think spending a little time counseling them and adding that happiness to a health outcome is as important. So I think that little hope, little touch of hand, little communication is as much important as giving thyroxine and monitoring the thyroid. And I'm certain that, you know, we need that tender loving care for in thyroid disorders, particularly for strongly positive on antibodies. And occasionally we do sometimes add a micronutrient like selenium, which may influence the antibody status apart from iodine. So the, the two critical micronutrients in thyroid disease, which can influence outcomes, is that if the person is pregnant, ensure that there is adequate iodine on board because the iodine requirement goes up. And if the antibody is strongly positive, 
ensure that they at least get adequate salary. So if facilities are available, occasionally we screen, particularly in people who have abnormal thyroid kinetics, a urinary iodine and a serum selenium also, and then ensure that we treat them to optimization. Uh, sir, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for that detailed discussion on the intricate relationship between thyroid health and reproductive challenges. And I'm sure uh, the audience today uh, would have uh, got a lot of information and uh, which would help them in improving their patient care uh, in the realm of thyroid dysfunction and infertility uh, in all their couples. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhuri, for the kind words. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you don't ever miss any episode. Let's embark on a mission to enlighten, empower, and engage. This is Aspire's Ed Talk, where learning has no boundaries. Thank you.